Number 51. Jiminy's journal error about Sabor. In Jiminy's journal, under the entry for Sabor, he lists the leopard as the following. A leopard feared by all who live in the jungle, and an enemy of Tarzan and the gorillas. Sabor is a cunning hunter who targets the weak and helpless. He stalked onto the scene in Tarzan 1999. Well, first off, Sabor is actually a she, not a he. The Disney canon officially recognises Sabor as female. And secondly, she only targeted one weak and helpless victim in the entire Tarzan movie, that being Kerchak and Carla's baby. Other than that, Sabor has hunted down three fully grown humans, two of which had guns, the alpha silverback gorilla of a tribe of gorillas, right in front of all the other gorillas in the pack. Which, by the way, is not an easy task, considering these gorillas are strong enough to reasonably take on grizzly bears. But she also fought Tarzan himself, who had a spear and was able to use the terrain to his advantage. Then in Kingdom Hearts, she fought, in no particular order, Sora, a guy who took down several world-ending threats before even coming to the jungle, Donald and Goofy, the Archmage of Disney Castle, who had enough power to one-shot Xehanort with a Zeta Flare, and the Captain of the Disney Castle Knights. And she also fought Tarzan on multiple occasions in this game as well, a fully grown human male with a spear and a terrain advantage. And not only does she come off as the loser due to several circumstances several times, but she also regularly comes back throughout the level to fight you in several rematches. Sabor is actually pretty strong, and is also pretty brave. She doesn't just pick on the weak and helpless, she clearly has some sort of grudge against humans. Number 52. Jiminy's journal mistake, Iago. Iago is actually miscolored in the journal. His wing feathers are supposed to be blue. However, they are colored as green in the journal. Number 53. Jiminy's Journal Animations There are only eight characters in Jiminy's Journal that have interesting animations. Lock Shock Barrel Ursula Cerberus Bambi Dumbo And, for some unknown reason, Selfie. The other character models are animated, but not in any meaningful way. They usually just have a slight movement back and forwards. Lock, Shock and Barrel will dance. Ursula and Cerberus will move their heads around. Bambi will dance up and down happily. Dumbo will also happily jump up and down, just while flying. And Selfie will wipe sand off of her right foot and will change pose periodically to have her hands either by her side or crossed behind her back. I don't know what made the game developers give Selfie an animation, especially considering that Sora, Riku, Kairi, and even the other Final Fantasy characters from the island don't have one. Number 54. Missing Dalmatians. If you played through the early section of the game, you may be aware that there are 99 Dalmatians missing throughout the worlds. Well, you can rescue all of them and bring them back to Pongo and Perdita's house in Traverse Town. After rescuing 99 puppies, you can go into the house yourself to count them all up, and you will only find 96 of them. That means that there are three Dalmatians that are missing. Number 55. Hidden Mickeys on the Dalmatians. You probably guessed it by now, but there are hidden Mickeys on Pongo, Pedita, and, from certain angles, the character model for the 99 puppies. Number 56. Strike Raid is overpowered. For those among you who didn't know, Strike Raid can be used in order to effortlessly cheese pretty much every boss in this game. Just maximise your MP by using either Spellbinder, Lady Luck, or Diamond Dust. Wear items like the Shiva Belt, Omega Arts, Cosmic Arts, or Royal Crown. And of course, level Sora up. If you chose the Rod at the beginning of the game, you should have at least 19 MP in total, which allows you to use Strike Raid nine times in a row. Then, with the maximum of six slots for Elixirs, you'll have 54 consecutive Strike Raid uses. And since Strike Raid hits five times per use, that's a total of 220 total hits, and that's just with Sora's MP slots. If you stock up Donald and Goofy with elixirs or mega elixirs, give Goofy his MP gift ability and then set them to use their items only on Sora, you can easily increase your item usage to over 300 total strike raid hits. No boss in this game has enough HP to survive an onslaught like this. Number 57. Simba is the best screen nuke in the game. Yep, the very first summon you get in the game is easily the best screen nuke in the entire game. 
It's easy to acquire, especially considering that it's really hard to miss. It stuns weak enemies with low effort. When fully charged, it does absurd damage to mob enemies, and enables you to pass to areas of the game that are far beyond your current level just by spamming the Proud Roar attack. Just watch this. Speedrunners do this on level 1. Number 58. Simba, Genie, and Bambi versus the Unknown Man. The Unknown Secret Boss, whom most of us already know the identity of, that being Xemnas, is one of the hardest bosses in the game, only outdone by Sephiroth, mostly because of his annoying shot release attack. But did you know that summoning Genie, Simba, or Bambi during that fight will actually stop him from casting shock release at all? You can just summon all three of these, one after the other, and then finish the battle off with a Strike Raid slash Elixir combo, and you may be able to fight him from start to finish without ever encountering the Shock Release attack at all. Number 59. Gravity is the best pseudo-screen nuke in the game. Gravity, Gravira, and Graviga are the only spells in the game that don't do damage based on Sora's stats. It does damage equal to a percentage of the enemy's health, obviously minus their own individual resistances to gravity magic. This enables you to defeat opponents with insanely large amounts of health in only a few seconds. This can be used to get rid of invisibles and angel stars with minimal effort, black fungus in only one second, battleship heartless in only two uses, and enables you to shred through 80% of the behemoth's health bar in only 5 to 10 seconds. Number 60. Thunder is the most useful attack spell in the game. It hits multiple enemies at the same time, it does similar amounts of damage to them as fire magic does, despite its range. It can hit opponents from much further away, or even directly above or below Sora, and there's only a handful of enemies in the game that are resistant to it. It's less useful in the late game, but it's still nonetheless useful. It's easily the second best spell to shortlist on the magic menu. Number 61. Fire is strong against water. Remember my last point about water elementals actually being blizzard elementals in disguise? Well, you'd think that Thunder would be the most effective element against all the enemies in Atlantica because they're all water elementals, and they're underwater, right? Surely fire should actually be nerfed in this environment, again, because you're underwater, right? Nope. All the Atlantican enemies are actually weak to fire. Fire can be used to clear out entire rooms of underwater enemies in only seconds. Number 62. Alternate win scenarios. I've already mentioned alternate cutscenes based on the order that you complete the game, but did you know there are certain battles that you can either win or lose without affecting the story? You probably knew that you could do this against Leon, Cloud, and Sabor, because the first time you fought them, you probably lost. And you probably also knew that you could just lose the race against Riku and progress from there with the gummy ship being named High Wind instead of Excalibur. But did you know that you can also lose the fight against the Dark Side in Dive to the Heart at the beginning of the game? Number 63. Lock, Shock, and Barrel boss fight. Lock, Shock, and Barrel are a set of very small and very fast enemies that serve as a very hard to overcome barrier to your progress in Halloween Town. But did you know that you can just stand over here in the corner just behind this cannon and you'll only get hit by whichever one of them decides to jump over to you at any given time? And they occasionally get trapped in there with you, which means you can just spam the X button and sometimes cure, which I've mapped the X button anyway, to win. And if you end up running out of MP, Usually, Shock will come over doing a spinning move, and since you can't get in, you can just counter it for free MP orbs. Number 64. Merlin's Magic Training. If you talk to Merlin at his house, he'll take you up into his loft and allow you to cast spells on his enchanted furniture. This serves as training. You'll have infinite MP while doing this, and you can stay up here as long as you want. So, how is this useful, you might ask? Well... Strangely enough, you can come up here and hit his furniture with physical attacks in order to restore your MP to maximum, which can be useful if you want to go to a place 
such as Olympus Coliseum, for example, that requires as much MP as possible. Obviously this is a little less useful once you get the Bambi summon, but until then it's a safe and effective way to maximise your MP before you go to a difficult place. Just come here, do a couple of combos on Merlin's stationary furniture, and then just leave to your destination. Number 65, the World Barrier. If you've read Ansem's reports, you'll probably know that the barrier between worlds is actually made of the same material as gummy ships. Yep, the world barriers are actually made of gummy blocks. Since the barrier between worlds is broken down, the Heartless can travel to these worlds using their own spaceships in order to take them over. But if you fly the gummy ship during gameplay, you can see giant walls made out of a strange colourful material. Well, this is the broken world barrier. These strange gummy decorations are actually the barrier between the worlds that's been broken down as per the lore. Number 66. Sora and Cloud's design. There are many of you out there who already know this, but Sora's design was originally going to be more lion-esque with spiky hair. It's going to have lion claws and a giant chainsaw blade instead of a keyblade. However, what you might have missed is these discarded design concepts appear to have been reused for Cloud. He has the spiky hair, large blade, and beast claws on his left hand. Of course, the majority of his design is based on Vincent Valentine from Final Fantasy VII. Number 67, Sephiroth's Wing. You may also know Sephiroth as the One-Winged Angel, and you may be mistaken to believe that this is because of his single large black wing that comes out of his right shoulder. However, did you know that this is actually a feature that's unique to Kingdom Hearts? and other media did not adopt this feature until after Kingdom Hearts came to fame. The wing itself is likely inspired from Sephiroth's final form, Safer Sephiroth, who has six white wings in replacing his legs, and one black wing replacing his right arm. Sephiroth is, of course, left-handed. Number 68. The Black Ballade Heartless. The Black Ballade Heartless has a throwing knife design on his hat which may be a reference to the throwing knives that were used by Larxene, number 12 of Organization 13, and their lightning user. It's also the only musical Heartless in the game to have visible legs, which look like bird legs. Not that it needs them, because it never lands on the ground. The other musical Heartless obviously do have bird legs, but they only show up when you hit them. <laughs> number 69. Hey, hey, shut up. Be mature here. Anyway, the Search Ghost and Grand Ghost Heartless. The Search Ghost and Grand Ghost Heartless actually have skeletons on the inside, which you can see by looking at them from the side. Number 70, White Knight Heartless. White Knight Heartless actually have a set of six ribs that protrude from their back and wrap around to the front of their design. Number 71, the Chimera. The Chimera actually does have a head which looks similar to a stitched-up doll inside of a jar on its head. Strangely enough, the head that you can see on the actual moving image in Jiminy's journal appears to be different than the image that is displayed in the top right corner. Number 72. Wizard Heartless. Wizard Heartless don't have eyes. Number 73. The Behemoth Heartless. There is only one Behemoth Heartless in the game, that one being behind the keyhole in the Hollow Bastion Dark Depths. Despite there being a total of one in the whole franchise, it still has a counter in Gemini's journal telling you how many of them you've defeated. This is the only boss in the game that does this. Even bosses that you fight multiple times, like Darkseid, don't keep track of how many of them you've defeated. Every other behemoth in the game is either an Ark Behemoth that you can fight in the final world, or a destroyed behemoth that's fought during Hades' Cup. Number 74, Angel Star Heartless. Angel Star Heartless also double as light bulb esque enemies. They have a light bulb esque implement on the inside of their transparent bodies. Also, their eyes form a hidden Mickey. Keeping with their light bulb theme, they are immune to thunder magic. Number 75, Armor Heartless. Guard Armor, Red Armor, and Opposite Armor have their Heartless emblems on the front and back of their bodies so that when they flip themselves over, the symbol on the back of their body will be the right way up. Also, Opposite Armor, being the only armor heartless that can fly, can follow you onto the rooftops of Traverse Town's 2nd District. You can also make Guard Armor follow you around the 2nd District too, but it obviously doesn't fly, 
and is also seemingly unable to follow you up the stairs or down either alleyway. For the opposite armor, you can stand in here where you would ring the spell, just lock on, spam triangle, and he is completely out of range, so he won't be able to hit you. This allows Donald and Goofy to just chip away at him until he runs out of health. Once he gets to phase two though, he can hit you with a plasma cannon attack, so do be careful about that one. However, this plasma cannon attack can be blocked by just standing behind one of your dead party members. Number 76. Parasite Cage can walk. You might not know this, and obviously I don't have any footage myself because it requires cheating, and I never ever cheat, guys. You can trust me, right? Anyway, Parasite Cage actually has legs on the bottom of its body, which it can use to root itself to the centre of the room. However, if you use cheat codes to get him outside of his intended boss arena, he'll actually slowly follow you around that arena by walking on his four small legs. I don't want to use another YouTuber's footage without permission, but I'll leave the link in the description along with the timestamp so you can see it for yourself. Number 77. Pure Blood Heartless vs Emblem Heartless Part 2. Did you know that there are more design philosophies that are present in Pure Blood and Emblem Heartless in this game? Firstly, Pure Blood Heartless obviously don't have any emblems on their body, but the point I want to focus on here is the fingers. Pure Blood Heartless tend to have five fingers on each hand, four fingers, one thumb. While Emblem Heartless tend to have four fingers on each hand, three fingers, and one thumb. The only exceptions to this rule are the Stealth Sneak and Sneak Army Heartless, which have five fingers on each hand, three fingers and two thumbs, Shadow Heartless and Giga Shadows as well, which are the only Pure Blood Heartless in the game that have hands with less than five fingers. Obviously, Dark Balls don't count, because, uh, yeah, you know, it should be obvious, guys. The Shadow and Giga Shadow Heartless have three fingers, which work as claws on the scratch attack. And the final Heartless that seems to break this design philosophy is the Phantom Heartless, which again is an Emblem Heartless, except it has the traditional Pure Blood style of having five fingers. Number 78, Pure Blood Heartless vs Emblem Heartless, Part 3. There's one more design philosophy behind Pure Blood vs Emblem Heartless in this game. Pure Blood Heartless have straight antenna, while Emblem Heartless tend to have a spiral shape on the end of their antenna. This even happens when the antenna is internal, as in the case of the Jellyfish Heartless. Number 79. Phantom Heartless's default heart colour. The Phantom Heartless has a colour changing heart orb, which you need to hit to do damage. This means you need to change from a physical attack, when it's glowing white, blue is blizzard, red is fire, and yellow means thunder. But in the entry in Jiminy's journal, it seems to imply that the default colour is red, as this is the colour that happens every single time you open up its character model. Number 80. Phantom 13. Did you know that the Phantom Heartless has 13 spiky tears on the end of its cloak? Number 81. Deep Jungle Vine Swing. Did you know that you can cheese the vine jumping minigame by just super gliding from location to location? Number 82. Soft Resetting. Simply holding down L1, L2, or 1, or 2, and then the Option button at the same time, will instantly turn the game off and take you back to the title screen. Number 83. Casting spells in the air is faster than casting them on the ground. Number 84. Kyrie's Kingdom Hearts 2 prototype. After defeating the final boss and watching through the credits, a secret movie will play, showing a preview of the fight between Roxas and Riku. The final scene will show Kairi running back to the beach on Destiny Island, wearing an outfit that we never see her in again. This is thought to be a prototype design for Kingdom Hearts 2. Number 85. Dive to the Heart. In the Dive to the Heart at the start of the game, there is a mysterious voice guiding you along. You never get to hear this voice out loud, though you experience it through text. So who is this mysterious voice, you may ask? Well, it turns out, it's Mickey Mouse. Number 86. The Sky. The sky in many areas of the game is a very simple design. The game doesn't really expect you to look in this direction, but by entering first person mode you can see some of the weird designs for the different skies. In the Dive to the Heart it's a gentle vortex. In Hollow Bastion's Lift Stop it's a well-designed glass ceiling. 
In Hello Bastion's final room, the one where you fight Riku Ansem, the ceiling is just pitch black. Number 87. The door in the Dive to the Heart. After completing some of the main tutorial parts from Dive to the Heart, you can enter this door that will enter the next room. However, you can do so from the back. However, if you do want to press triangle and enter the door from the back route, you will teleport to the front of the door in the cutscene that causes you to walk through it, though. Number 88. You don't need a wand or a weapon to cast magic. Yep, there's one bit of proof in this game that you can do spells without some sort of spell catalyst. During the scene at the beginning of the game, when Donald realises that King Mickey is gone, he tries to wake up Goofy to help him. Goofy, being a bit of a heavy sleeper, doesn't hear him, so Donald casts thunder on him without using his staff. Number 89. Cheating on Destiny Islands. During the fight against Tidus, Selfie, and or Whacker, you can come over here and pick up this barrel to throw at one of them. Doing so will stun them and allow you to get off one full combo. Also, you can leave it in the middle of the arena to disrupt Selfie's skipping rope attack. Number 90. You can intentionally fail the race with Riku in order to get a good shot of Sora, Riku, and Kairi all standing next to each other. The race won't end unless you touch the checkpoint. Not really the most useful tip, but if you want a good shot of all three of them standing next to each other in a neat row, this is the only place in the game where you're going to get this kind of shot. Number 91. Kairi and Mushrooms. If you keep talking to Kairi on Destiny Islands on day two, telling her that you have no clue where to find all the raft supplies, she will eventually give you a hint to find the mushrooms, telling you that they tend to grow in dark places. She will then reveal to you a piece of information about herself that's found nowhere else in the franchise. She doesn't like mushrooms. Number 92. Kairi and Coconuts. In a similar way to when you ask her for hints for mushrooms, she will also give you hints on where to find coconuts. And this time she will reveal that she likes coconuts. Number 93. Ars Arcanum, 7 and 13. The Ars Arcanum limit has 13 strikes in a combo. For 7 of these strikes, you're invincible. The remaining 6 are bashes that you need to spam triangle for. Number 94. The Keyblade abandoned Riku on Destiny Islands. There's an implication that's a pretty blink if you'll miss it, that Riku already took possession of the Keyblade on Destiny Islands, but it abandoned him when he voluntarily gave himself to the darkness. The Keyblade is known to have a mind of its own, and seems to want to align itself with the strongest hearts, which usually means that it will align itself with those who can best resist the darkness. During gameplay, you can interact with the Door to Darkness on Destiny Islands, and it will tell you that it's unopenable. Then during the final night, Sora makes his way out to Destiny Islands to help save the raft. When he does, he finds that Riku is already there. Based on the way the rest of the series went, this is what probably happened. Ansem, in robe form, came to Riku and informed him of his rights as a Keyblade wielder. He then planted the idea of opening the door to darkness in the secret place with it. Riku either took Kairi, or more likely Kairi invited herself at some point, and went to Destiny Islands out on their boats. Riku opened the door to darkness with the Keyblade, and after the darkness came spilling out of it, Kairi held back the darkness because of her status as a princess of heart. The same thing that the other six princesses do in Hollow Bastion if you talk to them at the castle chapel. This is why there is a door blocking the entry to the secret place when you get there as Sora. Riku is thrown out of the secret place by the darkness. He's probably talking to Ansem on the small island around about the time Sora gets to him. This would explain a number of things. It explains why Riku is standing out on the elevated platform on the little island in Destiny Islands, just staring out into space, as though another person was standing there talking to him, right as you get there with Sora. It would also explain why he's so confident in falling into that big shadowy portal, that it would take him to another world rather than just killing him. It would explain why you only get the Keyblade right after Riku gives into the darkness. It would explain why Kairi is standing right in front of the keyhole. It explains why Riku just casually takes the Keyblade from Sora twice. And it would explain why the world ends immediately after Kairi loses her heart and melts it to Sora. The island's destroyed immediately afterwards, and as soon as they are, the bigger Heartless, like the Dark Side, start to arrive. Kairi was on damage control, and the Keyblade abandoned Riku for Sora on Destiny Islands. 
Number 95, a Sniper Wild free spot. During the battle against the Sniper Wild, you can stand right here in the fountain to basically never get hit by any of the Sniper Wild's attacks. So if, let's say, you wanted to increase the number of Sniper Wilds that you've killed in the journal, you can just stand right here, take no damage, and then just hit them with thunder attacks. Number 96, Invisible Platform at Uki Boogie's Boss Manor in Halloween Town. Again, during the boss fight against Uki Boogie's Manor, you can stand right here, and you'll find that Sora can stand right there on an invisible platform. You don't have very much control of the camera, but you could snipe one of his dark orbs with fire or thunder. I haven't done much experimentation with this spot yet, but it's probably an infinite jump point. Number 97, Dancing Shadow Sora. In Neverland, during the fight against the Dancing Shadow Sora, if you come into this room before beating the Anti-Sora boss, you can push the Shadow Sora back against this wall. Then, he can actually fly up through this hole and up to the upper floor. This will obviously make him immune to every attack you have except for thunder and gravity. And of course, if you try to follow him up there, you will hit the loading zone and be warped to the next area instead of finding him. This of course means that there is a replica of the upstairs room just above this room, which is unenterable. Meanwhile, trying to enter it will warp you into the actual room. Number 98. Deep Jungle Minigame Teleportation. If you enter any minigame in Deep Jungle and then simply quit out, you will find yourself at the end of that minigame course. So if you start the vine swinging, and then quit out, you'll be teleported to the tree just in front of the treehouse section. And then if you start the jungle slider minigame and quit out, you'll find yourself teleported to just outside of Jane's tent. Number 99. Easily loopable bosses. Throughout the game, there are a lot of bosses that are extremely easy to force into a pattern that's extremely exploitable. So not counting Maleficent's dragon form and the easily exploitable stop spell spamming, you have... Clayton. Simply lure him to the top of this cliff, and then hit him into this corner endlessly without even doing a finishing move. It'll take a while, but Stealth Sneak has a lot of trouble getting up here. And as long as you do it from this angle, he won't be able to get up, and none of his laser attack can hit you from here. And Clayton, because he doesn't have any revenge value, will just sit there and let you hit him endlessly until his health is gone. Riku's fight on Destiny Islands can also be cheesed in a similar way. If you stand up here on this wooden platform, Riku will be stopped by an invisible barrier, and then he will just wave his arm and taunt you, saying, Come on! During this animation, he'll be open to a three-hit combo, meaning that you can just bait out his next attack, hide behind the barrier, and then just attack him while he's taunting you. Number 100. Official Canon Timings. Of course, this is a secret, and possibly an Easter egg for those who are willing to look at it. During the course of the game, Sora is transformed into a Shadow Heartless after he takes his own heart with the Keyblade of Heart. During this time, because his heart is strong, a nobody is formed in Twilight Town, Roxas. Xemnas finds Roxas pretty much immediately after he's formed, and gives him a name by rearranging the word Sora and adding X. This is the first day of Roxas's time with Organization 13. On day 6, Xemnas says to Roxas, I've been to see him. He looks a lot like you with him referring to Sora. This battle can happen at any time after the keyhole is sealed in Hollow Bastion, during the final mix of Kingdom Hearts 1. He will only appear after you reach the final world, the end of the world. So, assuming that Xemnas manages to control his giddiness, and leaves it one day before he decides to tell Roxas about his meeting with Sora, that means that day six of Roxas's life is one day after he met Sora and the gang at the end of the world, which is the earliest time you could fight him in the game. Sora arrives in Halloween Town on the 26th of September, as shown by the countdown to Halloween in the main district. Assuming that Sora warp drove from Hollow Bastion to Traverse Town, thus taking no time at all, it can be assumed that the events that take place in Traverse Town, Kyrie giving Sora the Oathkeeper, Sed fixing the gummy ship, etc., took place over the course of one afternoon. Sora had to manually drive back to Hollow Bastion afterwards, and then straight after that had to manually drive to the end of the world. The Xemnas boss fight appears around now. So, since Sora became a Heartless, it took one afternoon in Traverse Town. After that afternoon, 
Roxas would be going through day one of his time at the Organization 13. The events between that afternoon and the end of the world would have taken place within five days, so we can assume that Sora took down the behemoth within an hour or two, and then travelled in the gummy ship for about five days to the end of the world. Now, using Agrabah's desert as an example of time scale, it is day in the main streets of Agrabah, but night at the Cave of Wonders. Using the original movie as a reference, it's within a fair travelling distance for Jafar, because we could see him in front of the cave in the actual movie. You're required to spend one day in Agrabah, one night helping out Aladdin, one day fighting the Pot Centipede, one night in the Cave of Wonders, and one day again in Agrabah. This is a total of five days and nights, or four and a half days. Now we spend one day in Deep Jungle, one day in Wonderland, one day in Traverse Town, one day at Olympus, one night at Halloween Town, by which time it's the 26th of September. It would have taken at least one day in Atlantica to get from place to place just by swimming, so let's just extrapolate and say two days. One night in Neverland, one afternoon in Traverse Town, one day total in two trips to Hollow Bastion, one night in Traverse Town again, and less than one day between arriving at the end of the world and entering the final rest. So let's just round it up to one day at the Fallen Destiny Islands. With at least five days of travel time required between each world, and taking into account the Cups at Olympus, which would each require one full day to complete, and the Hades Cup, which takes, well, a day and a night to complete, also one day total for Sephiroth and Ice Titan, that would be four and a half days in Agrabah, two days in Atlantica, give or take, half a day in Halloween Town, one day in Monstro, half a day in Deep Jungle, half a day in Wonderland, six and a half days in Olympus, two days in Traverse Town, one day in Hollow Bastion, one day total in the Hundred Acre Wood, and one day at the end of the world. Five days of travel time multiplied by 11 means that 55 total days are spent travelling. So with all these equations factored in, the story of Kingdom Hearts would take place over approximately 75 days. Before reaching Halloween Town, there are between 35 or 40 days total before you actually reach Halloween Town, and this depends on whether or not you went to Atlantica first. Obviously, there are one and a half days on Destiny Islands, and this means that the story of Kingdom Hearts took place somewhere near the 16th of August, all the way to the 5th of December, after which it takes another 20 days, so Sora and the gang will reach Castle Oblivion by the 25th of December. And for our final entry on the list, number 101, a glitch that I personally discovered. The infinite jump glitch in Halloween Town, also known as the Out of Bounds glitch. A similar glitch was found in the original Kingdom Hearts game on the fallen version of Destiny Islands. Come to the bridge where the rare truffles spawn and land right here on this specific spot. You'll find that you can endlessly spam the jump button to rise to the top of the map. After some basic experimenting, I found that there's basically nothing really here. The top of the skybox is ridiculously high up, and the walls of the skybox, including the moon, are ridiculously far away. Once you leave the boundary of the map, there's no way to reduce your height, only to continue to increase it with the jump button. It's also possible to jump all the way over the walls to Moonlight Hill. The loading triggers will all appear in this area, and you can enter and exit without any concern, although no heartless will spawn from what I've seen. There doesn't seem to be any treasure chests out here either. You will be mildly surprised to learn that the area immediately outside the map is not designed to be walked on, making it very easy to get trapped. I have only managed to pull off this glitch a handful of times. If you walk out away from Moonlight Hill for approximately 40 straight minutes, and then turn back, the music will actually start to get pretty funky. possibly implies that we've walked into the boundary of another world, so if somebody out there could possibly figure out some sort of walk glitch, we could potentially walk to other worlds. Strangely enough, this would also explain how Riku managed to get from world to world without a pirate ship. Well guys, 
That was the 101 things that you didn't know about Kingdom Hearts. Like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and share this video with your friends. Doing any of these things will help my channel to grow, and will help me be recognized by the YouTube algorithm. Is anyone still here? Okay, for those of you who are real die-hard fans and have actually stuck around this long after the outro, here's number 102, for those of you who stuck around this long. And now for our actual final entry, number 103, Sabor chases her tail. Look at her go. Yep, in this mode, she doesn't do any damage, and she just runs around in a circle. You can walk into her as much as you want. Now, she's only supposed to be active in the upper part of the treehouse. So when she's in the lower part of the treehouse, her AI is programmed to run away. But it seems like she's also gotten locked back onto Tarzan or something at the same time. So now, she is stuck in one spot forever, until we, well, leave the area. If you've made it this far in the video, type Sabor, danger, in the comments section. Just a style on those plebs who didn't make it this far. The ones who were fooled by the original outro. Now here's the actual outro. Thanks for watching the video guys, like, comment, subscribe. Blah, blah, blah. See you next time.